Good morning. Good to see all of you here today. Glad everybody's in a friendly mood. We're going to have, begin our class in just a moment. Uh, this, of course, is the beginning of our meeting with Brother Larry Fife from Cary, North Carolina. And he's, of course, the uh, son of Ken and Bobby Stagg. We want to uh, pay attention to what we're studying today and um, hopefully make use of the opportunity this week to invite others to come to our meeting that will continue through Friday night at 7 o'clock for the weeknights and our regular worship times today. Um, we want to have a word of prayer before we begin. And uh, Wade, do you feel up to leading the prayer this morning? We'll let Wade bury it lead us in prayer. Good morning. Uh, first, let me say thank you for the invitation to be here. It's always a, a pleasure to be invited to speak at a gospel meeting. Certainly the honor that um, you think enough of me, or should I say my parents think enough of me anyway, uh, to be here to speak and certainly appreciate the elders' invitation. Um, this, this week we're going to talk about encounters with Jesus. And so when you think about encounters, obviously, and how we encounter people on a daily basis, but more so how we come to encounter Jesus in our lives and what we learn from, obviously, the process of how we encounter Him. All of us at one particular time in our lives have encountered Jesus to the extent by which we made the choice to become Christians, where we chose, like we see in Acts 2 and verse 38, to put on Christ in baptism, where we're added to the church, Acts 2 and verse 47. But what we also have to understand is the encounters in which we have, obviously, are usually... Obviously, not only through His Word, and we know God's Word is, is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, Second Timothy three sixteen and 17. And so by that aspect, we know that we can encounter Christ through His Word. Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John 1 and verse 1. And so when we think about how we encounter, maybe we found Jesus through His Word. Maybe we picked up a Bible one day and we came on to an understanding of the truth and knowledge that we gained and know that we need to be saved. But the thing that we really have to think about, and it's more often than not, is we encounter people through the people that we meet. Perhaps you came to Christ through someone that you met. Maybe someone invited you to church. Maybe someone told you about how they're a Christian and what that means to them. Maybe they told you about the fellowship that they enjoy in Jesus Christ. And all of those specific things that we think about when we encounter Jesus Christ specifically. And through that, that encounter, generally that brings about a change in who we are. So there's a change in our behavior. There's a change in the patterns and the way in which we live our lives. But more importantly, the best thing that we try and do is that we want to mimic who Jesus is. Paul talks about thinking like Christ. Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus. So when you think about this idea of encountering Christ, also once we encounter Christ, once we become Christians, once we understand what it means to be in the church, as Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 5 and being part of the body of Christ and all of those things that that entails, we also have the responsibility to ensure that when we encounter individuals, and more so when we encounter folks in the world, that we too want them to be able to encounter Jesus through us. We want them to see Jesus Christ as we encounter or they encounter in us who Jesus is supposed to be. So when we talk to the world specifically, what we have to remember is that the world is paying attention to us. The world wants to label us hypocrites. Why? Because they want to prove us wrong. There's a lot of people that we encounter on a particular basis. Maybe they understand and, and know that you're a Christian, and so they begin to ask you probing questions like the Pharisees did with Jesus, right? 
They, they continue to poke and they're trying to get on that side by which they can maybe stir up an emotion that you're going to reflect something that's not of the nature of Christ. But we also know that in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And so when we think about the aspect of how we encounter people on a daily basis, we want to ensure that we're reflecting the positive aspect of what it means to be a child in the Lord's church. Because if not, you can turn someone off quickly to what it means to come to Christ. And I hear about it and I see it all the time. Sometimes, brethren, we're our own worst enemy. Sometimes we become so dogmatic in doctrine. And I'm not taking away from the truth because the truth is what saves, John 8 and verse 32. But we become so dogmatic that we remove the aspect of the law by which Jesus was... Um, basically testifying to the, to the Pharisees and that they were so stuck on the patterns and the concepts of what they were teaching concerning the old law, he said, you left off the aspect by which God wants compassion to be interjected as well too. And if we can't empathize with a lost world, we're never going to come to be able to save individuals from their sins. Jesus says in Luke 19.10 that He came to seek and to save that which was lost. But here's the thing. Sometimes we only want to, psychologically speaking, because it's really how we're geared, we only want to associate with those of like-minded individuals. Usually we're drawn to people that think like we do, that dress like we do, that act like we do. Why? Because it's comfortable. It doesn't push us outside the realm of what we consider to be difficult or hard or uncomfortable, but... Brethren, when you think about it, once we become Christians, our mantra really should be of getting comfortable being uncomfortable. Because you are going to encounter people in the world that don't think like you, that don't act like you, and that don't dress like you. And that's exactly what Jesus was doing as we're going to talk about eating with sinners this morning. And what I want us to understand through this idea of what it means to eat with sinners, the best example that we have for the person with whom we should mimic and the person with whom we should imitate is Jesus Christ Himself. Again, when we let our light shine, the world needs to see Jesus in who we are. When the world hears us talk, when the world hears us engage people, they need to know that we're thinking just like Christ thinks. And so when we think about this aspect of what it means to eat with those that are lost in the world, sometimes we get uncomfortable because those sinners don't think like we do. Those sinners don't act the way that we act. Those sinners don't vote the way that we vote. Those sinners don't do the things that we like to do. And so when we think about it from the particular perspective that Jesus is approaching the sinners that we're going to talk about today, the Pharisees looked at them, those sinners, as outcasts. The Pharisees would label individuals, particularly with the way and how they chose to associate with individuals in society. Generally, they, those sinners were considered tax collectors, like we're going to read about here in just a moment in Matthew chapter 9. Matthew being the tax collector. Well, if we understand the historical perspective of what a tax collector is, a tax collector was someone who paid the Roman government the right to collect taxes from his own people and at the same time, if they were dishonest, they would pocket a little bit on the side themselves. And so generally, the Jews didn't like anyone who was taking away from them their hard-earned money and giving to the government by which they didn't want to associate with. But they still had to do it because it was law. And so when we think about individuals with whom we associate with, sometimes we're going to shy away from individuals that really think differently than us. Several years ago... Uh, my wife and I uh, had gone to a store, and I will tell you it was a makeup store. Not that I was thrilled, but uh, my wife said, we're going, so we went. So I said, yes, ma'am, and that's where we went. And so we went to the store, and of course, I'm following behind her with a purse and saying, yes, ma'am, and doing what she tells me to do, and we got to the counter. And as we got to the counter, the individual that was checking us out was what we see today and what we know is the hot-button topic transgender in society today. And we know it's everywhere. It's, it's where I'm at. I'm sure it's where you're at here in Arizona. It's something that's pretty prevalent in culture and society. And so this young man had makeup on and was dressed like a woman, and I got very uncomfortable. And so as we're walking out to the parking lot, I made the comment to my wife. I said, I just don't understand it. And I was frustrated. I, I just don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense to me, to which my wife is really good about giving me a piece of humble pie to eat, especially as a preacher. And she said, she looked at me very seriously and said, Honey, don't you think he needs Jesus too? 
Now, when you think about it from that perspective, and you think about the person with whom you're looking at, even though they don't look like you, even though they don't dress like you, even though they don't maybe, you know, think the way that you think, what we also have to remember is the person with whom you're looking and the person that you're addressing is a soul that Jesus would have sat down and had a meal with. Perhaps maybe what I should have done in that situation, instead of grumbling or complaining or murmuring, maybe I should have offered him an invitation to church or an invitation even to come eat at my house. Because when you look at Mark chapter 9, Jesus specifically, after he grabs Matthew and brings him in as one of his disciples, says, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go sit down at this house at dinner, which is generally kind of an open area, and we're going to have a meal. And so as Jesus is sitting and eating with these sinners, as it says, the Pharisees have issue with this, and so they come up to those disciples that are with him, and they ask the question, why is it that your master sits and eats with sinners? Now, when someone, if they were to ask us the same question, why are you associating with those people? Well, it's not because we think like they think. We don't agree with their particular lifestyle. But what we do see is an individual that needs to be loved, an individual that needs to be shown compassion, and an individual that, most importantly, needs to see who Jesus Christ is through us. If we're going to think like Christ, people need to also hear us talking like Christ. Every aspect of our lives has to reflect our Lord and Savior. Why? Because a lot of times the only encounter that people are going to have with Jesus is the encounter that they have with you. We've all heard it said a hundred times, I would rather see a sermon any day than hear a sermon any day. Why? Because our lives are to be sermons. So much to the extent that when people talk to us, they know who we are. Though they might disagree with us from the perspective of religion, they might not like what we teach. But one of the things that I've learned, brethren, is the devil is going to do what he does best in ensuring that the world doesn't like what we do. Sometimes I'll hear people complain, and we, can, and we all do it, and I'm just as guilty. We complain about the world, right? And we say, well, we don't understand why they don't do these things. But the problem is with our thinking is that we have to remember is that we're expecting the world to act like Christians. But brethren, they're not Christians. Jesus said to go into the world and preach the gospel to, listen to this, every creature, Matthew 28. That includes everyone, race, nationality, creed, socioeconomic background, education. It doesn't matter to whom we preach. The issue is, is that we're ensuring that we're preaching that everyone has an opportunity to see a reflection of who we are in Jesus Christ. Because if we don't do that, then what we're doing is we're omitting the commandments by which we're instructed to live by. And so we leave out, we commit a sin of omission by omitting the weightier things by which God wants us to focus on. So sometimes we have to remember that for us to reach out to the lost, we have to push ourselves past the point of being comfortable because Jesus didn't go into the areas that agreed with him for who he was. How many times did Jesus get backed into a corner because of who he was and what he was teaching? Numerous times, so much so that they wanted to kill him because of it. Even, the, even his disciples at one point came to him and said, Jesus, you, you need to calm down a little bit, okay? You see, here's the problem. These Pharisees don't like what you're teaching. And Jesus said, should I obey man or should I obey God? You see, Jesus said the issue was is that their mouths were confessing with me who I was, but their hearts were far from me. Brethren, we're going to be judged not by the things in which we say, but the manner in which we live our lives. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to answer for the things that we've done in this body, whether those things be good or whether those things be bad. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And so when we think about it, do we want to stand before God on the day of judgment and hear Him say, Oh, do you remember that particular encounter that made you uncomfortable where you didn't say anything to that person, but there's this lost soul that needed to hear about Jesus Christ, but yet you chose not to say anything? So let's talk about that. Now, we know we're not going to be judged for things of which we've been forgiven, but at the same time, we also have to realize that if we choose to walk past individuals that we know need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, no matter how they might believe, whatever aspect of culture they tend to bend towards, if we specifically leave out the way to your commands and the compassion by which we address and put into those commands, then we're just as guilty as the Pharisees. Um, perhaps you sing that song. Sometimes we sing it at Cary. You know, uh, you know if, if I would have only told you, if you would have only mentioned him to me, 
Day by day you walk by me, you didn't say anything, you didn't mention anything. If you had only mentioned him to me, now I've got to stand before God because you never told me about Jesus. But here's the thing, we have to remember, brethren, the church is not a country club. The church is not a cruise ship. It's not a place by which we, we become members of the church and we get comfortable and we sit on the seat of do-nothing, leaning on the elbows of do-less. Because we have to remember that the only time sometimes people are going to learn about Jesus is through our actions and through our activity. When you think about what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16, he talks about the idea of us being a sweet savor or a sweet aroma to Jesus, of Jesus Christ to the world. At the same time, he goes on to say to the church, but don't forget your actions can also do the exact opposite to those that are considered dead to God in the world because they're outside of Christ. So again, our actions reflect a direct correlation to who we're representing. When I was in the Marine Corps, Whenever we would get liberty or we'd go to these different countries, they were very adamant on giving us these liberty briefs before we'd go out into town. And they would tell us, one thing you have to remember is that you represent the entire Marine Corps. Doesn't matter where you are, doesn't matter what you're doing, but how you dress and how you act reflects on everybody who came before you in this great corps that we loved, so don't embarrass us. Well, brethren, it's the same thing for us because we have to remember the name that is attached to us is the person for which or who chose to die for us on the cross of Calvary. But God committed his love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Hebrews 5.8. And so when we think about the aspect of what Christ was willing to give to us in exchange that God loved us enough to die for us is the same message that the world needs to hear from us, isn't it? Because if they're not hearing that message from us, if they're hearing vitriol and hatred towards something, again, I'm not saying we agree with them. We have to be counterculture. But we're also to live in the world, but we're not to be of the world. We've heard that all the time. But when we realize that we're in the world, the only way that we affect the world is through engaging the world. Sometimes the problem is, is that we understand what it means to be holy. Paul said, be holy as I am holy. Reflecting to the church at Corinth, the issue was they were bound up in sin and fornication and they weren't taking care of their church problems. Paul said, the problem is, is that you obviously need an example of what holiness looks like. But sometimes we carry this idea of holiness to the extreme. Instead of being holy, 1 Peter 1 and verse 16, we become holier than that. And brethren, that's not a reflection of who Jesus was. Remember, Jesus came and were choosing individuals that weren't liked of society. If you go back and you look at the 12 apostles that he chose, let me ask you this question. Do you think Jesus made a mistake by choosing the one to whom we're going, to the one to, that ended up uh, betraying him? Obviously, we know that he was perfect. He was tempted at all points like we were, yet without sin. And because when we think about all of the individuals that Jesus Christ chose to be the ones that were going to be sent into the world to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the masses that were lost, he chose individuals that most people didn't care for. He chose a tax collector. Here he chooses Peter, which sometimes I think is kind of funny because I think perhaps I relate most to Peter because we all can relate to Peter. How many times did Peter put his foot in his mouth, right? We can all do that, right? We've all done that, right? Shake your head like this. Sure. We've all put our foot in our mouth. But when we think about Peter, of all the mistakes that he made, even to the point of rejecting his Lord and Savior three times, to, to which Peter said, Oh, Lord, that's never going to be me, right? Because we've all said that. I would never treat anybody differently. I, I would never cast anyone out because they didn't think like me or dress like me or act like me. That's not going to be me. I'm not going to do that. And then it happens. And someone spits on you or rejects you or calls you a liar or a hypocrite or a bigot because you don't believe in their particular bend on what they believe culturally speaking. And then what do we do? We get all puffed up. We go against 1 Corinthians 13 and we puff ourselves out and we try to defend ourselves when Jesus chose to use humility to teach the best lessons. And so when we encounter individuals in society that disagree with us wholeheartedly, the best medicine for that particular action concerning our reaction to their vitriol is to reflect and think like Jesus Christ thinks. Why? Because you catch more flies with honey than you do vinegar. You see, when we choose to be negative towards a negative society, and the world is certainly that, 
when we think about how horrible life is, rather than think about how bad it was for the Christians in the first century. You see, they couldn't even walk down the street confessing who they were. Generally, if they were, they were either beaten, they were cast into prison, and sometimes even worse, they were killed. Now, when's the last time you walked down the street professing your Christianity or your life as a child of God that someone beat you, spit on you, threw rocks at you, or even worse, killed you? We don't have to worry about that here for the most part. Now, I can't say that's not the case in other parts of the world where gospel preachers are succumbing to those things. Just several months ago, uh, I read a particular email that someone sent me about some missionaries in India that were teaching, that were uh, preaching one particular Sunday, and the police came in who were of Hindu, you know, kind of ethnic background, and came in and arrested them and threw them in jail because they didn't want them preaching Christianity. Now, generally, we don't have to worry about that here. You see, we've got it pretty easy, but I think sometimes easiness also equals the aspect to which we become so comfortable that we no longer do what we're required to do. Brethren, Christianity is not a life of ease. God doesn't look for us to the extent by which we're warming pews every Sunday, and that's all we're doing. God expects us to be active in His kingdom. If you recall, going back to the Old Testament, the issue with the Israelites was, bless their hearts, right? They continue to make the same mistakes over and over. But God said the issue with the Israelites was, because you rejected me, because you didn't listen to my commands, I'm also going to reject you. Because they were getting comfortable. They found themselves falling away because they weren't challenged in their own faith. But we know that we're required every day to continue to add to our faith. Second Peter chapter 1, 5-8. through 8. Peter says giving all diligence, meaning we have to put forth effort. Christianity is not a lazy affair. Again, it's not a country club. It's the church by which a man gave his life for. Giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience brotherly kindness. And Peter goes on to say, and if you remember these things, you remember that you were purged from your old sins, and then he recalls who was it that died for you. But he said, if you forget these things, if you don't add these things and pay attention to them, giving forth a diligent effort, which means a constant forth of pushing forward, the Greek says, of adding these things to our faith, which increases our strength in who we are. When you think about Paul in Ephesians, where he talks about putting on the whole armor of God. Brother, when he gives us the whole armor, we don't just get to go up and go, well, you know what? I think this shield is good enough for today. I think that's all I need. You see, that's not going to be very effective in battle, is it? Especially if the devil's coming at us. The devil, 1 Peter 5, 8, is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You recall when he came in front of God in Job chapter 1, and what does God say? Well, Satan, what you been up to today? He didn't say sitting at the house drinking coffee, did he? He said, well, just walking about to and fro, just trying to get into some kind of trouble. Brethren, you see, that's what the devil is doing on a continual basis in the world. It's comfortable for us here because the majority of us think the same way. You know, we love each other, we fellowship with each other, all of those things because we have like-minded faith. We've been brought into the fold of God. We've been brought into the family. But maybe perhaps you're here this morning and you weren't reared in the church. You know, I was blessed to be reared in the church. My grandfather was a gospel preacher. So I was around it my whole life. But at the same time, I also have wonderful friends who are sound, faithful gospel preachers who weren't blessed to be reared in the church. Someone taught them. They encountered someone. My particular friend, his wife, was reared in the church and she taught him. And it was funny, he tells the story all the time that, you know, he told his wife that he wasn't going to believe none of that nonsense that his wife's church preaches to him. He's a gospel preacher now, by the way. He listened to his wife, but first he listened to Jesus. You see that gospel is the power of God and salvation to save mankind, Romans 1 and verse 16. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it has the power to bring mankind to its knees to realize that it needs to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And what we have to realize, brethren, when we're teaching individuals about the gospel, we also need to ensure that we're excited about the gospel, of why we're wanting individuals to be saved by the gospel. Why? Because sometimes in the church we sit back and we look like we've been weaned on dill pickles, don't we? Sit there and, you know, we sing, Jesus loves me, this, I, that. Well, that's not very Christian-like, is it? It's not exactly expressing who Jesus Christ is. We're supposed to be joyous, right? 
Rejoice always in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice, Philippians 4 and verse 4. Why do we rejoice? Brethren, we have every reason to rejoice because of who Jesus Christ is. We think about thinking like Christ. We also think about Paul, what he writes in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now set down on the right hand of God. Think about that verse for a moment and how sobering that should be for us. Jesus, looking unto Jesus, that means pay attention to what Jesus Christ did at Calvary and to the extent by which He died for us to be saved. Brethren, that's the message we're trying to share. But when we look to Jesus, who's the author, the beginning of our faith, the author and the finisher of our faith, who brought it into existence by dying on the cross of Calvary for us, the same message the world needs to see when we think about how great and how glorious that gift was. You see, there's joy in the cross, but there's also sadness because a man had to die that I might be saved. So when we think about sharing that same message and what it means to eat with sinners like Jesus was sitting down and eating with sinners in Matthew chapter 9, the point that he's trying to express to the Pharisees when they're stressing to him, we can't believe you're choosing to eat with people like this those outcasts of society, the ones that nobody wants to talk to. But how often do we make the effort to go to those people that no one wants to talk to? Maybe you remember in high school, I recall in high school, in the cafeteria, you remember how everyone was segmented? You know, you had the jocks over here, had the skaters over here, the band geeks over here, right? Hey, I was a band geek, so I can say that the band geeks over here, you know, so everybody was kind of segregated. Nobody crossed boundaries or lines because then your group would look at you like you had lost your mind. What are you thinking? You know, band geeks don't associate with these people and these people don't associate with these people. But we do the same thing in society, don't we? You see, we have this problem of putting people into boxes. Generally, from the outset of those boxes, we judge strictly based on appearance. But when the Pharisees said, your, your master eats with sinners, what did Jesus say? Hmm. Jesus said, I came to the earth not to call the ones who are healed, but as a physician I came to take care of the ones that are sick. Well, Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means you and that means me. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we know that because we've been there. We've been the outcast, we've been the sinner, but we're Christians now, and so we're no longer sinners. But because society is so judgmental, extremely judgmental, to the extent that if you don't agree with someone, then you're wrong. The truth is no longer relevant or truth. Now the truth is just simply, you know, you can choose what the truth is. At least that's what society says. But Jesus said that we're sanctified by the truth, John 17, 17. We're set apart We're different, and we're supposed to be different. Ecclesia means the called out ones. We're literally pulled out of the world. Well, that's what we're trying to do with the gospel. But we have this tendency to put people into boxes. You see, I love when I fly, I'm a people watcher. I love to watch people. And I like to play this game with myself. As I'm sitting there, you try to figure someone out. You know, probably 99.9% of the time I'm wrong. But just by looking at that person, you'll say, well, obviously they're this type of person. They probably have this kind of job or they're this kind of people, right? And so from an external appearance, we're judging that person. And sometimes we do it to the detriment of our own faith. You see, we'll put someone in a box because of political prowess, because of economic background, because of skin color, because of the way they dress, because of the way they look. And so let's, let's do that for just a moment. Let's, let's judge people that we see and do it simply from a worldly perspective and put those people into boxes. And so let's put people of different color here. People of, you know, maybe these are the older folks, right? We're going to put them here. And over here, we're going to put those kids who just, they're kind of crazy. They don't think like we think. And over here, you know, we're going to put people who have a college education. Over here, these are the more blue-collar workers. And so we've got all these nice, pretty little boxes from an external perspective. But now let's start asking some more probing questions. You see, when we think about sitting down and eating with people that think differently from us, generally from this kind of horizontal perspective, if we think about it, they're really 
pretty close to us. You see, because we're not perfect. We know that there was only one man that died on the cross that was considered to be perfect, yet he chose imperfect people to associate with. So we got these nice pretty boxes. And so here we have people of different colors, right? Maybe they don't come from the same area that we do. Maybe they're of a different nationality. And so simply we're judging them based on appearance only. And now let me ask another question. How many people in that group group are struggling with losing a loved one? You see, oh, now it gets real, right? You see, maybe they've lost a parent just like you. And so now, guess what we have in common? We have grief in common. We know what it means to lose someone. So there I have a point of reference by which I can now associate with that person and I can have a conversation. Maybe they didn't have the greatest upbringing like you. Maybe they came from a poor, uneducated background and and neither did you. And you had a pretty rough life, but you were able to get out of that, that house or that neighborhood and make something of yourself. Maybe you can think just like they think. You see, now the externals, the physicals tend to kind of dwindle away and now we're focused on the internal things you see I, I can I can I can relate because I too lost a loved one and and I know what that pain and that grief feels like and guess what now I've just opened the evangelistic door of opportunity and now this person can relate to me and guess what now maybe because he had up his guard because I'm a Christian right I'm this Bible toting person maybe they too have put their guard down And they're going to listen to what I have to say now. Because, you know, I can say, hey, guess what? I don't know your grief, but I know grief. You know, it's interesting that grief is the only thing that we truly do alone in this life. You and I can experience the exact same loss, but we're going to grieve differently. But at the same time, there's also the common bond of the loss that helps us to also relate and have compassion towards each other. Galatians 6, we know that Paul's writing to the church at Galatia. These are the gullible Galatians. They are the church, but at the same time, it also is for us as well when we think about those in the world. In Galatians 6, 6, 2, Paul said, Bear you one of those burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so bearing burdens, those that are in the world, taking off of them and removing the external judgmental factors... And looking at the internal aspect of the heart, because brethren, when you think about it, that's how we're going to be judged. First Samuel 16 and verse 2, right? Thinking about looking at David. The issue was they were looking at the stature of the individual. You see, they wanted this mighty king. They wanted this big man to have this prowess over all the enemies of the nation of Israel. And God said, there's a problem here. You see, the issue is, is that you're looking on the countenance of the man. God says, I'm looking on his heart. Heart is a determining factor by which our faith is applied. When you think about that, they try and look at the psychology of why men do certain things in battle and why men are willing to give their lives for their brothers or their sisters. And sometimes you would look at an individual and he can be maybe this scrawny little person. You'd think he ain't going to be nothing in battle. And that's the person that jumps on the grenade that saves his friends and wins the Congressional Medal of Honor. You see, again, we can look on the countenance of the individual and we judge on the appearance of the person, but we're not looking at the person's heart. Brethren, the world is hurting. And when I say hurting, it's hurting in sin. Not only is it hurting, it's groping in sin. And the world needs to see the reflection of Jesus in us as we have these conversations. Now, I know what you're thinking. Larry, the issue is nobody wants to listen. And I agree. Screaming gets you nowhere in a conversation. I do couples counseling. I use something called hope therapy. Helping uh, effectively or, you know, helping basically how do we handle our problems effectively. And so when you think about it, you're sitting individuals who are struggling in their relationship. They don't know how to communicate with each other. And a lot of times they sometimes come in screaming at each other. And so I let them go through their motions and I let them get all their stuff out of their things. And then I say, as they sit down, the next thing I do is I make them hold hands. Ooh, they love that. I want y'all to hold hands. And they're like this. Like they got cooties or something, like they're four. So I make them hold hands and then I ask them this question. What did you hear the other person say? Usually, 99% of the time, I didn't hear anything. You want to know why? 
because they weren't listening. They listened to respond, not listening to understand. When we sit down and eat with sinners, brethren, we need to be quiet and we need to listen. We have the truth. We have the saving message of the gospel of Jesus Christ to share with them. You know, we, we hold on to that truth sometimes because we're afraid to share that which God has given to us because they're not like us. But sometimes if we listen, we realize in that moment, even though they're completely different than we are, they're usually more, what, similar than we realize. And in that, when we find common ground to relate, all of those, again, external things tend to melt away and we can begin to focus on what matters the most, and that's Jesus. You know, whenever I've had conversations, and I've had difficult conversations with folks with whom I disagree, what I've found as you begin to listen and allow them to explore, and sometimes they just want to know that you care, generally they'll listen to what you have to say. And when we do that, then we establish a relationship. I think we're under this mindset sometimes and that we forget that evangelism is relationships. It's all about relationships. It's about, what, establishing and pulling together relationships. And once people begin to build trust, they're more likely to listen to you. When I used to do mission work over in Murmansk, Russia. And when you would go over there, one of the things I learned is when we would go sit down, there was this one particular lady that had been coming to church for three years there. Finally, the local preacher and the other missionary that I went with were, were able to sit down and, and talk with her. She invited us into her house. That's a big deal when a Russian invites you into their house and offers you tea and food. And then when you sit down with them, they don't want to talk about the Bible. They want to know about you. They want to know where you come from. They want to know about your family. They want to know about your upbringing. Why? Because they're determining whether or not they can judge you. You want to know why they do that? Think about the oppression of which Russians came out of and all of their history and what they had to go through through communism and all of the dictators and stuff and how they were treated. So they're not going to trust you at face value because what you tell them means absolutely nothing to them until they can trust you as a person. Well, it's the same thing that applies when Jesus was sitting down with these sinners. You recall in Luke chapter 15 as he's, again, sitting down with sinners? And he begins to, again, he's pointed out by the Pharisees, what, what, what's your master doing? And so he begins to tell the, the, the particular parables. He talks about uh, the lost sheep, how the, the shepherd leaves the 90 and 90 and he goes to find the one and he brings it back. And guess what? And then the Lord or the angels in heaven rejoice because over one sinner that's saved. And then he talks about the, the, the woman who lost the coin in her house. And what does she do? She tears up the house trying to find that one coin. And then she rejoices over it. But if you think about it, we have people that are lost in the church too. You see, sometimes we have the same mindset that everybody should think like we think. But brethren, if you look around and if we truly ask the question, I'm going to break this thing in a minute because I keep kicking it. If we truly ask the question, those that are around us sometimes because we put people in boxes as Christians, well, I can look at that family right there and they've got it all together. The preacher, I mean, they, the preacher's got it all together. I get that all the time. You know, my, I love my wife dearly. Don't get me wrong. I'm blessed beyond measure, and I don't deserve her. And sometimes, guess what? She doesn't like me very much. As she tells me, she says, I love you, but I don't like you right now. And one day, we were trying to get the kids in the car, and, you know, three kids were trying to get into the car, and we're, you know, kind of getting irritated with each other because she wanted to leave at this time, and I want to leave this time, so... We're fussing in the car, and we get to the church building, and we get out of the car, and somebody says, Hey, Sister Fife, and y'all say, she's like, Hey, how are y'all doing? <laughs> See, that looks all great, right? And then somebody went up to my wife one time, and she said, It just must be a blessing and a joy to be married to him. My wife said, You have no idea. <laughs> you see, it's easy to judge on the appearance. It's easy to look at other Christians on Sunday morning and think that they have it all together. Brethren, this is a house for the hurting. It's a hospital. And sometimes we treat it like a country club. We treat it as if it's just a place that we come and we sit back and we relax. We get a nice little sermon on Sunday and we go back to our lives on Monday morning and back into the world. But you see, brethren, we should be able to come here when we're hurting and when we need to be encouraged and that my brother and sister will put their arm around me and say, I got you. I know that you're hurting. I got you. 
Let me help you. You see, we're, we're strong, right? We, we're strong Christians. We don't want to have any chinks in our armor and our faith. But rather than Jesus sees us and sees how we're hurting, and He wants us, the world to know that as I can relate to those with whatever issue it is, they too can see that I'm not perfect and I'm hurting. And at one point in our, in our, our lives, we're all going to struggle with something, probably more than once. And whatever that is, when they can see the way in which we relate to each other, what did Jesus say? By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, what? If you have love for each other. That's how they're going to know that we're Christians. And when they see that reflected in us, they're going to say, hey, there must be something to this thing called Christianity. And when they see that we're willing to break down the external physical barrier walls and get to the meteor things and look at a person's heart instead of their stature then they're going to be willing to listen to the conversation. What questions or comments do you have? I know we've got a few minutes left, but any questions or comments? Crystal clear, clear as mud? Right? Well, thank you for your time. I greatly appreciate it.